Hi there! Augie and I are joining you once again from the fabulous studios at Casa Richard Productions, aka our living room in lovely far south Austin. The weather this year certainly kept us all spinning, but as always, CTG viewers rallied. Here's what they've got growing on this fall to inspire your garden dreams in the new year. First, many gardeners wondered why bearded irises bloomed in November. In Hearn, near Bryan College Station, Robert Gonzalez and his partner John aren't complaining about this gorgeous surprise. A cold front that dropped many of us into the 40s or lower earlier this fall, followed by the return of warm and dry weather is likely the reason for this unseasonable floral show. Another first for Robert and John, flowers on their snake plant. Also called mother-in-law's tongue, this Dracaena trifasciata houseplant belongs to John's mom. From Tucson, Arizona, Amy's got a great question about houseplants. Can she recycle her coffee grounds in houseplant containers? Although the short answer is yes, in moderation, it would be better to compost them instead. Coffee grounds do add a small amount of plant nutrients and may slightly acidify the soil, but should be added sparingly, if at all. Add those grounds to your compost pile instead, where the microbes will love them. reynaldo has got a mystery with his Desert Museum Palo Verde. This summer, a critter was chewing or scraping the bark. He placed a protective barrier in case of deer, but the problem wasn't solved. He hasn't spotted the culprit and wanted to know if this is serious and what kind of protection is best. Unfortunately, the bark of young trees like this one is very thin, leaving it vulnerable to even the slightest mechanical damage. When the bark is scraped away like this, the growing region just underneath it may also be damaged, leading to dieback in the branches above. Squirrels, raccoons, or basically any climbing animal may have caused this problem. So a netting to encase the entire tree for a few years until it gets older and the bark is thicker might be necessary to give the tree a chance to recover. Since February's freeze impacted our wildlife, everybody was especially delighted to welcome butterflies. Gerald and Kathy Basham sent greetings from Plantersville where they counted 12 monarch caterpillars munching away on their tropical milkweed. In Buda last September, Gardener Ryan Vaux snapped this beautiful shot of a monarch butterfly posing for the camera as dark clouds moved in. He also asked, when should we cut down tropical milkweed? We asked Drake White, a native plant garden designer in San Antonio who recommends cutting it back twice a year, in the first week of June and again in October through December. Milkweeds are the larval host plant food for monarch butterflies, but the adults nectar on many different flowers. In Arkansas, Roy Wilson watched monarchs grab a quick meal on his lantana. Perhaps they were on their way over to our gardens? In Lago Vista, Beggy Borgstrand raises monarchs in protective enclosures to observe the cycle of life. Then she releases them into her butterfly garden, inspired by CTG. Her adorable miniature schnauzer Dusty supervises. This year, she documented the cycle from tiny eggs to quickly growing voracious caterpillars. And what a treasure to watch this one pupate into a chrysalis. Becky wrote, It was like liquid flowing from the bottom of the larva to the top and then becoming a hard shell. Best yet, Becky was on the spot to watch this one emerge. She told us, I do my part, one or two at a time. They're precious. The whole metamorphosis process is like a gift from God. Summertime's annual zinnias are big hits with many butterflies. Along with monarchs, Brigitte and Stephen Tannen watch graceful tiger swallowtails in their garden. In Cyprus, outside Houston, hummingbirds nectar on zinnias in Carol and Ralph Villalpando's garden. Carol also grabbed this spectacular picture of a hummingbird on their weather vane. We love what she wrote. CTG is so informative for us both. I wake up to a cup of coffee and an episode of CTG. As soon as I come to the living room, he hits play. We watch the show and then head out to tend to the plants in the garden. It's so fulfilling to the soul to help grow what God created and enjoy watching God's creation flourish before our very eyes. Artist and gallery exhibitor Gail Dentler shared a few photos of her work in South Central Texas. One of her goals is to document hummingbirds as they migrate through Texas and how our plants help them on their long journey. She wrote, I love your show and gardening. 
and thought some of my photos might inspire conservation and stewardship of our beautiful planet. In Houston, Shelley McDaniel's garden is a feast for hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. Summertime annual Pentas feeds butterflies like tiger swallowtails. And a sulfur butterfly sipped from a kufia, which is also a hummingbird favorite. Bill Bauta hosts a popular spot for hummingbirds and butterflies in his Zurich San Antonio garden. In full sun, this pocket combines thryallis, tropical sage, verbena, coneflower, and a variegated yucca. Earlier, he cut back the coneflowers and verbena, but notes that they'll be back in full force. In East Austin, Robert Villarreal enticed many resident and migrating butterflies and hummingbirds to his fall blooming plants. Golden-hued Copper Canyon Daisy and Mexican Mint Marigold are companions to crimson and gold chrysanthemums and native tropical sage. Reed Smith spotted this striking Texas spiny lizard basking in his Dripping Springs garden. Mark Sepulveda admires the architecture of his stapelia. The scent? Not so much. Since it's pollinated by flies, its clever strategy is to smell like rotting meat. Although it's also called starfish flower cactus, it isn't a cactus at all. But it is a succulent and is native to South Africa. Last spring, Amy wrongly planted just three morning glory seeds along her fence in Little River Academy near Temple. Now look at the glorious results. Morning glories provide nectar for bees, butterflies, and moths. They abound in San Antonio for Karen Wilson, who spots countless pollinators every day. She's made lots of hot chili oil from the chili piquins that flourish in her neighborhood. And a nearby pond, complete with canna lilies and a black willow, refresh thirsty wildlife. Muley grasses attract attention all winter. From Fayette County, Agnes Ficus shared her golf muley. Earlier, David Hamilton sent in this gorgeous photo of his spider lily, Hymenocallus tropical giant. Although these bulbs are cold hardy, wait until next spring if you want to add them to your part sun garden. Native annual Eryngium leavenworthii splashed textural purple blooms across Brian Isbell's garden north of Fort Worth. We can seed out these summer to fall beauties in fall and spring. Brian looks forward to the purple to lavender and pink spring flowers on his perennial native spiderwort. Its strappy leaves are popping up now along with wildflower rosettes. Freckles, Brian's Blue Healer Corgi Mix, promises to keep an eye on its progress. And we'd love to hear from you. Click on over to centraltexasgardener.org to send us your pictures, stories, and video.